Massimo, everybody's talking about the environment, particularly climate change. We have um, um, diversity of, of, uh, of species that's a concern. Um, what can a philosopher of biology bring to this social debate? Yes, everybody's talking about the environment, but not many people are doing something <laughs> about the environment. That's, that's the problem. Philosophical approaches to the issue of the environment, preservation of the environment, or the relationship that we should have toward the environment can take a number of forms. In philosophy of science, for instance, you could ask the question of whenever uh, scientists propose a approach to, let's say, climate change, to ameliorate climate change, uh, is that approach sound in terms of the relationship between the theory and the data? So this is a typical thing that uh, philosophers do, right? Uh, the, That's the important because some people dis disagree. Correct. So, so a philosopher can come in and help clarifying the conceptual underpinnings of that whole approach before you even actually get to the empirical you know, evidence per se. The other thing that a philosopher can contribute is a clarification of a conceptual clarification of the entire the, the entire issue of you know why do we care about the environment in the first place? Mm -hmm. What kind of values should be uh, we considering? Uh, for instance, sometimes you hear people saying that uh, planet Earth would be better off without yeah. human beings, yeah, right? That, yeah. that strikes me as somewhat bizarre kind of thinking. Yeah. Not only because it's self-destructive uh, in a sense. Uh, and it doesn't seem to take seriously the, the amount of suffering that that sort of outcome would, would imply. But also because without human beings, as far as we know, there is no concept of value. And, and uh, the, you know, the environment doesn't have value. <laughs> when you say the environment is better off or the, the planet mm -hmm. will be better off, the planet is not the kind of thing that is better off or worse <laughs> off. We are better off or worse mm -hmm. off uh, if we do certain things as opposed to other things. So there is... Sometimes even just basic levels of, of uh, confusion about what does it mean to have this debate in the, fir in the mm -hmm. first place. And then, of course, the third one is the issue of ethics. That's not really philosophy of science. It's, it's more moral philosophy. But, you know, when it comes to you know, how much interference with the environment is going to cost in terms of suffering, in terms of resources, in terms of, you know, how do sh should we prioritize things? Who is going to benefit from, from what kind of course of action? Those are all ethical questions that don't have an obvious empirical answer. You can't do the experiment and, and yeah. figure it out. So climate in general and the environment in general are really, I would think, the kind of problems that is ideally situated for a positive, constructive interaction between different parties. And some, some of those parties, I would think, would have to be philosophers of science and ethicists. One uh, uh, theory that has been gaining uh, at least public attention is so-called long-termism, which says that in our um, allocation of resources, in our considerations, we need to now wait future generations, not the ones that are 50 and 100 years, but the ones that might be a million or 10 million years. And so even if you use whatever discounted uh, weighted average of the value of a future generation to now, you have a great preponderance of responsibility. So if you're really thinking ethically and morally, you really should think of those future generations. Yeah. Uh, other people criticize that because that could lead to various uh, either excuses or real decisions to uh, Im impoverish people today because of some long-term thinking. But these are, these are, you know, hard questions. Perhaps they are. Uh, my take on long-termism is uh, uh, the one that Jeremy Bentham, the founder of utilitarianism, famously had used in a different, in different context, and that's it. Nonsense on stilts. <laughs> There's a very high level of nonsense. <laughs> Why? Because the problem with long-termism is precisely that we have no idea what's going to happen that many generations down the, down the road. And anybody who claims that they do, it's either fooling themselves or trying to fool others. That's a general problem, I think, with the, ironically, with the utilitarian approach to ethics. So the utilitarian approach is based on this notion that we need to look at the consequences and only at the consequences yeah. of our actions. Not your intentions, not general kind of rules like a deontologist would do, but only at the consequences. Well, yes, but the problem is what is the stopping rule? Consequences up until what? One generation, two, five, ten, a million? And 
there is no answer to that question. No, no utilitarian that I know of has ever actually come up with an answer with a stopping rule of some sort. So technically, you want to go on an ad infinitum, at least until the end of the universe. Well, good luck with that, first of all. Second of all, it becomes an issue of epistemology. Um, Human systems are chaotic systems in the technical sense of the term. That is, they are highly dependent on initial conditions, which means that even if they are, even if you think of human societies as deterministic systems, which they probably are, uh, there is no way to tell with any precision what's going to happen just even a few generations or a few cycles down the road, let alone tens of thousands or millions of cycles. So in theory, it may be good in practicality. It has right. no, no value. It's entirely impractical. And therefore, it seems to me that ethics is nothing if not practical or should be uh, nothing if not practical. So if we're talking about things that are in theory uh, valuable, but in fact, you cannot do anything about it, uh, I really don't think we should be wasting our time. So how do you then allocate the, the different kinds of philosophical approaches to weigh on the issue of uh, ecology and the environment? W what are the different categories? You said eth ethical, but ethical limited to our generation and our children's generation? Uh, yeah, I think that, I think that um, uh, from an ethical perspective, we should act in pretty much the way in which we act at a level of personal decision making. When you make decisions that have ethical import, who are you, do you have in mind? Usually your own generation and the next one. Maybe two generations down yeah. the road. Okay. Maybe. Okay. And the reason for that, again, it's not because you don't care about potential uh, human beings in the distant future. It's just because you don't know. <laughs> you have no idea what's going to happen mm -hmm. there. And therefore, it's useless to, to sort of worry yourself with that sort of stuff. In a sense, we are um, mark of chain kinds of systems. Uh, it's one step at a time. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to be able to look more than two or three steps down the road. And therefore, we should be focused on, on, on what we can look at and then hope that the next generation who is going to be able to extend mm -hmm. the chain by another one or two steps is going to try to do the same or try to do their best. Yeah, the, the one or two steps we have right now are really serious ones. So They're yeah. very serious. <laughs> so it's enough to worry about that one. We already don't have much of an idea of, of how to solve the problem now in the immediate. So I, I would really not waste much time thinking 10,000 generations down the road.